Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at lionroxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I am your host, Ryan Roxy, and I'm sporting a new guitar pick. Thank you very much to our guitar pick manufacturers. One of some great guitar pick manufacturers that work with us, uh, Omega. I don't know why I'm just talking out of the gate, talking about guitar picks, but look, it's my 77 Jennifer Aniston pick. You got to love it. Come on. They surprised me with that design. So what are you doing, everybody? As everybody fills into the live chat right now, thank you very much. If you are not listening to us in the live chat right now, which is our YouTube channel, that is Ryan Roxy Official uh, YouTube right there. Uh, hit that subscribe button if this is your first time uh, watching us. But if you're listening to us on one of the podcasts, whether it's Apple or Spotify or any of those other streaming platforms, thank you very much. But We want you here. Living color, all right? High def. We want you here to experience all the pictures, the photos, the memories that our uh, illustrious producer, Vic Chalfant, will put up uh, during our show today. Because today, we're going to celebrate the old heavy metal. You know, I love having guitar players on the podcast. And uh, this guitar player has kind of taken the world by storm. You know, the funny thing is, he's still considered the new guy, but he's in the band for uh, quite a while. And I think you know the band and I think you know the guitar player. Would you please welcome from Judas Priest into the trenches, Richie Faulkner. Hello, Richie. Lord Roxy. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure. Wow. I've never been called the Lord. <laughs> finally catch up with uh, your, your good bad self, man. How you doing? That's good. We have actually brushed, uh, I think your leather jacket touched my uh, fur jacket, uh, like, yes. you know, going from ba upstage, backstage, wherever. And uh, we've done plenty of festivals together, whether it's with uh, Alice Cooper and Judas Priest or, yes. you know, um, I know you've done some really great charity gigs with Alice, the Christmas pudding, and you yes. were able to uh, jam with my cohorts. You were able to jam with Nita Strauss as well as Tommy. And uh, there you go. There's a Little Christmas pudding memory. Um, so again, thank you for being a part of our world. But most of all, thank you for uh, being a part and carrying the torch of this thing we call heavy rock, heavy metal. It's a pleasure, and it's great to see uh, your, your picks as well. I'm a, I'm a fan of, you know. Uh, <laughs> Are you Team Jennifer, <laughs> or just, just 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 different types of guitar picks? You like that's it? really cool. Who who makes them? Uh, this is Omega. This is a, this is the company, and they and they always surprise me with different designs. You know, I'll, I'll send them a, a couple of designs. They'll go, "That's cool," but check this out, and then they'll have like five or six different ones. So at, at this cool. at this point, I mean, I got I got my influence from guitar picks, and I think a lot of my stage moves definitely throwing the pick up in the air from uh, one of my guitar heroes, Rick Nielsen. Oh, killer! So, who did you get your? Hey, there's a Richie Faulkner. Uh, Nice guitar pick, Judas Priest. Um, who did you get your guitar influences right out of the gate? Well, a, a big one was, um, and still is, is Michael Schenker. Um, you know, the Flying V. Um, luckily, it was the same color hair, uh, <laughs> you know, European and all that. But um, Schenker was a big one. But it was, you know, um, and he, he opened up for Priest a couple of years ago in uh, the UK it was Michael Schenker's Temple of Rock and I was out there every night watching him and it was just a just a master class in guitar playing just like you know it wasn't it wasn't a load of widdly widdly it was phrasing and melody and widdly widdly when it needed it um, right. but just it was just every it was a master class in songwriting and uh, just everything a, a guitar player should be in, in my eyes so uh, he's the word tasty been, the word oh, tasty just, just comes up. Taste, um, note choice, you know, ev everything. Everything that a hard rock, heavy metal guitar player should be was encapsulated in, in that in that man. And, uh, and and still is. And, you know, so it was for me back then, uh, the Metallica guys, um, the Maiden guys, Jimi Hendrix, of course, 
Um, That's what I was going to say. Jimi Hendrix, I, although he, the picture that Vic puts up right there is, you know, obviously made famous with the Stratocaster. Jimi Hendrix did play a flying V as well and played it, you know, quite cool upside down and everything. But is it true? You know, we're going to do a little fact and fiction all throughout the podcast. Uh, is it true that he was one of the first person people that inspired you to start playing the guitar? A thousand percent. Yeah. And I think I mean, I'm, I'm not the only. It's definitely a fact. I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, alone. I don't think. Uh, you know, it, just the, just the, the visual of the guy, um, and then obviously that you know what goes in your ears when you hear something like that is just like, what is that, and how do I go about making my life about it? You know what I mean? <laughs> and you were, and you were watching live recordings of his concerts, right? And that's what. Yeah, sort I, of... I think it was the the Monterey Monterey concert and the uh, live at Atlanta. Atlanta, I think it was. They were they were the they were the first two that I remember seeing and, and hearing. And and just again, just the visual spectacle and the oral spectacle of the man was just life changing, not only for me, obviously, but for, for millions of people and still continues to be. Well, that's the cool thing I think about where we're at, because we've taken the torch from these masters, like the, the, the big ones, the big guitar players and Michael Shanker being one of them. I actually do talk a lot about uh, the, that tonal quality that he has with uh, his sort of what he brought to the game was taking that wah wah pedal and putting it somewhere halfway in between. It just gave him that really sweet tone, but you know, we're in that business as well as passing the torch on to other uh younger people that want to learn how to get to play guitar or if they're even older, it doesn't matter. We just want more people playing guitar. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I'm always, it's tough these days. You know, I was watching that Beatles documentary uh, about get a back. month ago. Yeah. yeah. And um, you know, back in the day you could, you, you know, if, you know, the sex pistols or uh, you name it, you know, if it was the mid sixties, you could put a couple of chords together and it was revolutionary you know, uh, or the sound that you were using was totally revolutionary. If it was a, a distorted sound, it was relatively easy to come up with something new, if you know what I mean. Uh, right. These days, it's not that easy anymore. So, and stylistically as well. So to come up with something that's, that's unique, uh, for me, is a challenge. And it's always a, a journey to come up with something that's uniquely my voice. Um, because it's a lot of stuff has been done, you know, there's loads of different styles and the tapestry of styles is, is vast, you know. So yeah. it's finding something that's uniquely me to take from all of that that's gone before, make different and then send into the future where someone else can interpret that in their own way and then take forward into their future is a is a tough thing to do. So I'm always trying to find that voice that's uniquely mine. And I don't think I'll ever find it, but someone else might interpret it in a different and way. Turn something, and turn it into their own. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully, because I, you know, I always well, struggle to find something that doesn't sound like Michael Schenker. <laughs> but at the same time, do you feel, because I'm going to talk about Priest in just a little bit, but I want to talk about you. This is all about you, Richie Faulkner, this uh, podcast. And, do you think that this unique style that you're searching for, and I think you actually have an, uh, a sound, a vibe, will it and is it part of a solo album? Can you see it being a solo album? And is it something that you've thought about putting out anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, it's something, I mean, I, I haven't really spoken much about it um, publicly, but there, there is something I've kind of been wrestling together during uh, during the COVID period, I mean, I know we're still going through it, but uh, there's been a lot of a lot of downtime. So I've used that time to kind of get some songs that I've been working on, get them together, polish them up, get some people together that you know I, I respect in the music business, and uh, you know record some stuff. And I haven't spoken a lot about it. It's in the process of being finalised, and you know we're yeah. looking for deals and stuff. So. The, you well, nobody want wants to, to ever. Uh, you don't want to jump the gun on it because, no. in the, you, again, you don't want to make the. You know, you don't want to be five years down the line and still not releasing it. No. You know, Chinese it's, democracy it's style. Of, <laughs> we're looking. We're looking for deals at the moment. You know, we're looking for record labels. So I don't want to get too far. You know, ahead, ahead. of myself. Yeah. But, will it be um, something so that you will be something that you feel that you you bring your voice to as well as your guitar playing, or will you have guest singers, or is it could be a combination of both? 
Well, I, I've always been into the band. It, it's never really been a, a so. It's never been like Richie Richie Faulkner's Rainbow or anything like that. You know, it's it's been. I've always been into the band. Uh, you know, with the band name and the four or five guys or girls in it, um, rather than. You know what I mean? A solo. Well, project. you might you might have some pushback with Richie Faulkner's Rainbow, just so you know. Yeah, that's that already been taken, unfortunately. You know, yeah, but, um, Richie's something, you know, maybe yeah. not Rainbow. But um, um, but also when I when I joined Priest, I didn't want to sort of get the gig and then straight away, you know, oh, now listen to my solo thing. Priest, they sort of they welcomed me in. They gave me a voice. They gave me an opinion, and I felt like this was my band. You know what I mean? They've they've made me a part of it, and I, I give I gave back a thousand percent. So I didn't yeah. want to sort of then do my own thing and abuse that opportunity, if you know what I mean. But yeah. ten or eleven years in, I, I think I feel that fans know that I'm not going to abuse that opportunity. Yeah. I've given you know ten, eleven, almost twelve years now, so I've. I felt, you know, with the, the pandemic as well, I've got a bit of downtime. Maybe yeah. put some uh, some stuff into that. But as far as stylistically, it's always hard to to tell. Really, you just do what you do. Yeah. Um, and as I said, I think and there's people, obvious influences for, with that. You know, yeah, you know, when you know, if and when it comes out, um, you you'll hear it. You, you'll hear the influences in there. I think it's you can hear where the roots are from Priest, but it, I think it's different enough to be its own monster, you know, and then hopefully, as we said, someone else in, interprets it in their own way and hears something completely different to what I hear, hopefully, you know, and, uh, and I am own. siding with when it comes out, but you know, again, I'm definitely cup is half full, uh, drink is half full. Uh, <laughs> and you've been through a hell of a lot this last year. So there is so much to talk about. And I want to, again, you know, when you came out, I don't know if you remember, but you know, still considered the new guy. I think I saw one of your very first press conferences um, at Sweden Rock. And the mm -hmm. thing that impressed me about you most is that just how comfortable you felt you were able to fill some pretty damn big shoes. And it wasn't arrogance. It was confidence. And that, I feel, is a big big uh differential between players that are insecure and then have to act arrogant and players that know their shit and are confident and you seemed from the get-go very confident with priest oh, i appreciate that man I, I think the difference is you can't really fake confidence you have to be confident uh yeah. you you have to fake arrogance you know what i mean because you you know what i mean um yeah. But I, I was confident, and and the guys they gave me that confidence as well. As I said, when I joined the band, they they welcomed me in. They gave me, uh, as I said, an opinion. They gave me a voice, and they made me feel like a part of a family. And that that only helped really. But I remember even from the the audition stage, when I got the um, the chance to go up and all, like audition and play with um, for Glenn and Rob, I just remember thinking, you don't get many chances like this, um, and I know that. I've got a, I've got a shot, you know, I've got a chance at this. I know I can at least, I've got a shot, you know, so I, I was quietly confident. Um, but I, I, I wasn't arrogant whatsoever. I was just kind of uh, very grateful to be given the opportunity just to have a shot at it. Um, yeah. And then whatever happened, happened. But I just, I knew I was, I could, I could handle it. You know, you'd done the homework. You'd definitely done the homework. And I could tell, and, and even from one of the, those first gigs and one of those first um, uh, festival gigs at Sweden rock, I remember one of the questions asking, so uh, is this going to be your last time around? And you were like, hell no, I, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't join this band for one tour in, in, in one or, you know, in one way of saying it or not, it was that vibe. And everybody was like, yeah, that this guy's going to, you know, help us continue the legacy of Judas Priest? Well, it was from, from day one, Glenn did say to me, you know, he said, I wish I could tell you that we were, we've got another 20 years left. Um, you know, he said, this is billed as the final tour and I wish I could, I wish we were going on longer. Um, as it worked out, you know, I, I was prepared for it to be the last tour. Right. Um, and as you know, 12 years later, or 11 years later, we're still, you know, right. we're gearing up to go out uh, for another tour. <laughs> and we're 
working on another record. So, uh, you know, I had no idea it was going to go on for this long, but I can see why it's gone on for 50 years with them, you know, because yeah. they're just, just insanely passionate about what they do. You know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the secret um, behind doing it? You know, what do you think it is that enables them to do it for 50 years? And I think half of it is the, the loyal fan base, obviously, that puts them there for 50 years. And the other half of it is, I think, a genuine love for what they do. It, it's infectious. They do a, you, you can see, we, we did the farewell tour, the Epitaph tour, and it s sort of fired us all up for another record. So we went and done another record. And you know what it's like. It fires you up to go and do it yeah. live. So you go and do it live, and then that fires you up. Oh, we've got to do, you start coming up with riffs, you know, in sound check and stuff. So, oh, we've got to go back in the studio and record this. So you go and record it, and the circle continues, you know, and then, all 12 more years for you. I mean, I was put in the same exact position with Alice. It was, you know, promised a one year tour and that was it. And our first tour out with Scorpions and then, you know, on and off for 25 years later, we, <laughs> we, play, we played last night. And, and it's because of that passion that not just you know, Alice has, not just Judas Priest has, it's the Judas Priest fans and the yep. Alice Cooper fans that keep yep. this whole train rolling and i and and we always do that that's why we do things like this podcast so um people that do support us and our bands understand how much we appreciate their help Absolutely. and support Absolutely, oh, wow. that's a good pick um, Vic. one of the one of the most surprising things i remember as well i mean i don't know if you had the same thing when you joined alice was i joined priest and as you said i think the second show we did was sweden rock so we were out in europe and I thought it was going to be, I thought the fan base was going to be a certain age group, you know, maybe 50 and up, you know, 45 and up. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I went out and Sweden Rock was a great example. And I, I looked down the front and there were kids down there, of maybe 12, 13 years old with their horns yeah. in the air. And I was shocked to see the age, of how young these, because it, it was different generations now. Generational, so it, it was definitely. the, you know, dad and their kids and now their kids coming out <laughs> to, you know listen to dad's records three I, yeah, yeah. we're in three generation bands yeah we, I, I would say alice and, and judas priest qualifies three generation bands i mean if we, get to, yeah. if we get to four we're doing pretty good we're we way <laughs> out we've out we way outstayed what we were promised at the very first part so um very quickly i want to go back to get forward just so we can make sure we talk about this 50 year anniversary as the main event but let's go back to get forward vic what do you say so we're talking here with richie faulkner in the trenches if this is your first first time of checking our podcast out make sure you hit that subscribe button right down there in the corner that vic somewhere in the corner there it is that vic Chalfont will put up for us thank you there very much thanks to everybody on the crew and team that helped out with this episode uh federica you did a great job with the script i got a lot of information not a lot of time to to talk about so much stuff because honestly this especially this last year in particular it's been a lot of life and death harrowing experiences but let's go back real quick to uh that 2011 um, audition and you um, sort of filling in those big shoes of KK Downing, who's been on the podcast as well. Um, how did it came about from what I have been told is it came about from a mutual friend of ours, a mutual bandmate of, of that was in the Alice Cooper alumni um, star performer of Wayne's world, Mr. Pete Friesen. Um, you and Pete were in a band called Metalworks, and were you playing priest songs in that band, or how did that recommendation come about? Well, yeah, we, it was it was a general cover band, so it wasn't just priest stuff. Uh, you know, we we did like Bad Company and Black Sabbath, and uh, I mean, you name it, we did it. You know, um, and me and Pete played together. Pete would come down and do the the late set with Les Binks, who used to play in Judas Priest. So. Um, we used to play every Sunday in Camden Town in, in London, and it was a riot. It was an absolute blast. And um, Pete always said if he couldn't do something, he'd, he'd put my name forward for, for it, you know, whatever it was. Um, and I think a couple of guys in the Priest crew, when, when Ken couldn't do it anymore, um, a couple of guys in the Priest crew knew Pete from the Almighty. 
Um, which was another band he was in after Alice, I think. Of course, no, um, it was before Alice or during. Yeah, it was after Alice, but then and then Pete came back because I, I right. played with Pete uh, during the Brutal Planet era. That's right. And yeah. uh, so, so Pete's been, you know, a staple in the Alice Cooper Band alumni for, you know, it's like a brotherhood of all the guitar players that have that have been in. I think we're we're in the twenties. You're very. Uh, much lower count of guitarists in Judas Priest. I think, oh, yeah. uh, you know, so it's a very select few. Um, so he, he gave you that endorsement. And what, do you remember what songs you auditioned? Uh, not really. It wasn't really an audition. It wasn't an audition. No, Glenn, no. Glenn knew that I could play. So he just, he just wanted to, he'd seen me on online, you know, and he just wanted to see me play in, in real life. Uh, and see how what I was like as as a as a person. You, you know, you know what it's like. You know, you can play, but that's like twenty five percent of the gig. Yeah. Can you yeah. hang? Can yeah, you hang? can can you hang? Are you a nice person? Are you a timekeeper? You know, all that other stuff. If you're a good player, that gets you in the door, and it's all the other stuff that gets. You know what I mean? That's that sort of stuff. No. So um, they, they gave they wanted me to play. I think it was four songs. They wanted to hear what I would do on them. And I think it was Blood Red Skies, Victim of Changes um beyond the realms of death i think were three of them so he said go away and do your interpretations of those solos because i think all three of them were big kk solos so i did that and then went back a week later um and they, they gave me the gig but um and then did it, you change it did you did you put enough of kk's influence in it and then made it your own or how did, how did you approach that sort of thing because yeah that i wondered about that with with you know with my audition with alice i had to make a judgment call because you know they had said poison which is a very shredding song yeah um i had, I had learned it but there was guys like kip winger who ended up being you know my co-guitar player in the first lineup for many years that he knew all that stuff so I'd made a little switch at the audition. I said, look, be the seventies guy, be the, you know, oh, yeah. the legato guy. And then just do that thing and kind of look as cool as you can. Yeah. But how, how did you approach those solos for, for when they told you to say, Hey, do what you do your thing. I don't remember. <laughs> like, I, I just, cause I was planning. Cover you you obviously did something, you know, yeah. that checked all the boxes. I guess so. And I always, when I was in the, it was in the cover band. <laughs> that was me there. That was that's not me. That's funny actually. But, Who is um, that? I don't know. <laughs> why, why would that's Vic really put funny. that up? I that's think that's really a picture funny. of Vic, our producer. That's that what could it is. Have been me. Um, <laughs> you know, playing in the cover band and stuff like that. I would always approach the solos. There, there were certain motifs that you had to keep the same, and then you'd kind of keep it. You would try and put your own little thing in around it. You know, uh, and I think I just approached it the same way. So I, I, I did what I thought had to be the same and then if i couldn't play a bit i'd make my own bit up you know i'd always do that as well if, if i couldn't quite manage it right. or it was a bit out of my capability I, i'd kind of blag it you know and then <laughs> you just can't say, blag it blag it yeah blag I, it blag, you know just yeah blag it it's like artistic license so, something in the pentatonic realm yeah <laughs> is that is? now that's that's another thing i'll ask when we have guitar players on i'll say you know, were you classically influenced or you are, you know, scales, harmonic minor stuff, or is it a pentatonic based blues type of bass, or is it just how you feel or, or a whole combination of everything? That's a different world, man. All that stuff. It's all kind of, um, it's a, yeah, I kind of learned by ear. So, or, that, as a, or is it ear training? Yeah, that's the thing. You can learn, you know, you're playing your favorite Michael Shanker record. He might be playing out of a harmonic minor solo sometimes, but he'll go back to his pentatonic. And if you can just yeah. cop those licks, then yeah. all of a sudden you are, whether you know it or not, you're playing pentatonic. Yeah, if it sounds right, it, it is right to me, you know, and it, it could be this mode or that scale. I couldn't, I couldn't really tell you. You don't yeah. know the, the the technical. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's as all as I know is that there's twelve notes total, yeah. you know, yeah. and seven notes without the sharps and flats. So, other than that, and they've all been used a million different ways, a million different times. It's our job to come up with new ways to do it. And as you said earlier, it's it seems as though with the evolution of rock, it's harder and harder to get that. You know, where's my little niche niche yeah. in this genre? Yeah, because no, I mean, Hendrix didn't know. 
Hendrix was, you know, he was going from this scale to that scale. He didn't know. He just, he just played what resonated with his heart. You know what I mean? Right. So he didn't know what mode it was in. You know, it was just, it was in the universe mode. You know what I'm saying? It just touched <laughs> everyone. So you play the universal scale. I like it. That's well, from now on. That's what I'm going to say. That's what, what is Richie Faulkner? Where do you learn from the universal scale? <laughs> <laughs> Not pentatonic, not harmonic minor, just universal. And it's, it's kind. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about this 50 year anniversary because this a bit is the main event uh, that you are celebrating. Obviously, obviously um, a lot of things have led up to this. And there has been a little bit of controversy, whether you want to, uh, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. Controversy seems to be sort of the, you know, the thing of 2022. But this was supposed to be a celebration of 50 years starting the fall of 2020 something sort of happened and uh some little thing called the pandemic end of the world uh, as my boss likes to call it the plague um <laughs> you, you were you were uh, kind of forced to reconfigure your road plans and then um something happened literally this past september that was life-changing life-altering oh yeah and have you talked much about that uh, have you dealt with it are you you know what was one of those things it's like you're on stage and it's it seems like one of the craziest things to like feel like something's wrong something's not right but you finished the set of course <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you do you know that's what well, you do. Um, so how did it i mean did it come about in the beginning of the set and you go or, or was it even before you went on you said something don't feel right today no, no. I mean, looking back on it, you can always, you can join the dots looking back, you know what I mean? There, there, if I was tired that day. Tiredness is a sign of, um, of, of it. Um, but <laughs> So anyone that's tired out there. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. Like three weeks into a tour, you're finding your, your legs anyway. You, you're going to, you find, you know, we're getting used to the schedule. We're going to be tired two or three weeks in. There's jet um, lag. There was nothing that was out of the ordinary for, for that time in a tour schedule. So there was no signs whatsoever. I was just up there halfway through painkiller and my chest just went bang. And I thought, well, that doesn't happen every day. You know? Um, yeah. That, that was literally painkilling. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it didn't go away. And it, it was around, luckily we usually have an hour and 40 set, uh, but tonight Metallica were playing, so we had an hour set, and this was the last song. If it wasn't, I would have carried on, like 1,000%, I would have carried on, killed over, and that would have been it. Because when, when these things go, I mean, I didn't know any of this beforehand. There's, a, there's a time limit. There's a time you have minutes. There's minutes. What happens is it ruptures, and it bleeds into your chest cavity, and you bleed out inside yourself, and you go. That's it. So, um, wow literally so it, it it blew up inside so i'm playing along what the fuck was that um and i started to feel a bit faint so i'm walking I, I remember walking back from the edge of the stage just in case i've never fainted i've never passed out before but i i started thinking this is what it feels like because obviously the blood was draining out of the extremities everywhere else going into your chest cavity yeah so that's what was happening uh, again looking looking back i didn't know this at the time and you're like, this is not indigestion. This is not Mexican food I ate last I night. I thought, this is... to be honest with you, I thought I was having a heart attack okay. um, because it was it was in the chest cavity and it was getting it was pretty painful. Right. Um, and I, all my energy was depleted I, at the end of the the, the, the song. I usually lift the the flying V up in the air, and I just couldn't. I couldn't lift it. I, I had nothing. All right, all right. So and, I and, came off stage and sort of collapsed into a chair. The paramedics came out, and it went from there. Um, these EMT, these paramedics. I mean, I know I give Dave Grohl's team because I was at that show in Gothenburg where he broke his leg, and the one uh, emergency guy held his leg there, which is very cool to do. Yeah, but yeah. these guys friggin' saved your life. I'm telling you, people don't recover. People don't get to the hospital. I mean, dude, again, the, there was one of the best heart hotel, uh, hotels, <laughs> hospitals in the country four miles be... away. Wow. Four okay. miles away. Like, like if, if the odds were stacked slightly differently, 
dude, honestly, I don't know how I don't know how I even got to the hospital. Like people don't make it to the hospital. It's like, and when I got there, so I got there. This was I, I was still in my leathers in in the, in the ambulance. So I had to like I went back to the the dressing room, got my jeans on, whatever. Got to the hospital. They found out what it was. Rushed me into the uh, the emergency room. Yeah. They got me under. So they, they started to operate, and so they 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 cut into my chest. So I got a, you know the they open heart surgery. So they cut your rib cage open. As soon as they did that, the whole thing ruptured. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, this is like right out of a you know right out of an alien movie. It seems honestly, like honestly, yeah. and I, I didn't know any of this. So my other half, she's out waiting for me. Wow. Um, and the the, the surgeon came out and told her. He said, "You better go and get you call family." To come and with, come and be with you, because he's not going to come out. He's not yeah. coming out, and he told her why. But they've just, you know, cut into me, and the whole thing's gone. Um, I don't know how they did it, but they they gave me four blood transfusions, um, and somehow they they work. They're miracle workers. These surgeons and doctors and nurses in there. I was in there for twelve hours, um, and they they had to stitch me up in the end. They they they. Uh, replaced me with like mechanical valves. There's, um, I think there's five mechanical pieces in there. Uh, they had to wow. stitch me up in the end because I couldn't, I couldn't be out any longer because of brain damage issues and stuff. Right. Um, but they, they did it. They stitched me up and dude, I don't know how they did it, but, um, you, you are now, you are becoming a bit of the Terminator guitar player because you're half <laughs> machine, you're half machine, half human now. <laughs> literally, I think Rob's jealous because I'm, I'm literally, got, I'm made of metal now, you know. But, um, <laughs> no, all joking aside though, man, I mean, again, the doctors and nurses and, you know, the, the support system that I've had yeah. has been miraculous and it's just, yeah. I, I shouldn't be here. I honestly shouldn't be you, here. I mean, at, at that point, do you think, there has to be a reason why I'm still around and to do this. And th there has to be a, a, a reason why I'm able to fill this role and, you know, be able to continue because so many people in put in that same exact position, you know, I don't think, I don't think they would have made it. I, they didn't have your, of course, I'm going to finish the shed. Of course, I'm not going to die. Of course, I'm going to do this. I'm going to continue. So, I mean, it's just, a, it's a pretty, fucking crazy story was there ever a point when you were on stage or you were going to the hospital said oh this this could be it or did you just say it was it never accepted in your mind i didn't really have time to think about it it was um too fast it was too quick yeah. because as i said we got off stage into the ambulance with the medics and stuff i got changed quickly into the hospital into the emergency room i had to sign some papers it was like yeah. I had to, you know, wh where everything was going, you know, um, in the event of if I didn't come out, you know, the dependence and stuff like that. And, you know, it was literally 45 minutes later I was in I was in the emergency room. Um, See, it, if you were in the Alice Cooper band and your chest would have ruptured on stage, Alice would have found a way to do that every night. He was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, <that's> great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I mean, how can we work this into the set? I like this. This is a good, good really show. Fun. It's good. <laughs> totally. But I will say that the surgeons were saying, you know, um, the fact that we were playing. If I was walking along the street and it ruptured, the adrenaline I, that perhaps adrenaline. was already in your body that you yeah. already have a rush, and, and yeah. that's that's not so, lost on Judas Priest fans. So I was literally saved by a heavy metal, essentially. <laughs> saved by Judas. Judas Priest fans can take credit that they saved Richie Faulkner's life, they, along with medical geniuses. Uh, yeah. What, what's, the, what's the shout out to the to the uh, hospital and the doctor? Do you have any like, oh, this, this guy? When when I do interviews, I thank this team or I thank this this group. Well, the surgeon, there was, there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them that did it. Uh, but the main okay. surgeon that did it was is Dr. Power, his name was. So I called him Dr. Fou the Firepower, honestly. Uh, um, man, this is this has Hollywood screenplay written all over it, you know? One of his surgeons was called Mark Slaughter. Not not the Mark Slaughter, but he, he was called Mark Slaughter as well. But no, honestly, we're all joking aside, it's, it was the um, U of L uh, Jewish Hospital in um, 
uh, I mean, I'm getting emotional about it, but like right. just everyone there just, I mean, you know, they say like miracles and stuff. They, they were the miracle workers. They really were. That's amazing. And you're very lucky that that Dr. Mark Slaughter was on the night shift. I, I heard he was up all night. <laughs> slept all day. <laughs> See, yeah, the, the jokes are scripted all writes itself. But yeah. listen, I don't, I, I don't want to harp on uh, on the whole plight of of the, of the Richie Faulkner experience. But that is a crazy experience, and honestly, I can hardly wait for the uh, HBO special to come out. So, <laughs> about, a, a lot, as well as shopping record deals, you should be shopping movie deals for that story as well. No, but I'm let's move lucky. on because. Lucky. What's happened uh, just recently, because that obviously took a turn uh, that you're going to take some time off, a little time off. But even you, like right now, I'm thinking like this is happening, you know, in in, in September of, you know, last year. And and then all of a sudden it's like you're here, you're ready to go. Like what's the rehab like on something like that? Did they just say, you know, you're fixed now or is it constant? Are you going to, are they going to have to go back in there and, and put some, are you going to need a tune up basically? Well, I'm not, I'm not completely fixed. They, they, if you imagine my heart's fine, uh, what right. blew up was the aorta, which is like a big vein that comes out of the heart and goes down. It's like a big question mark. So it, go, it goes out of the heart and it curves and it goes down to your right. waist. So it, Vic, it do you have a, uh, do you have a, uh, Vic, I think Vic has a, uh, actual graphic of that. Do you not have that? Okay. He, I bet he doesn't. I thought he so, was. Okay. So <laughs> it's like, it's like a curve like that. So it, it burst around the curve, uh, and right. it dissected all the way, it split all the way down. And you know, you've got like arteries up that go up to your brain. Uh, like they run up the side of your neck there. So they dissected as well, which means they split, they split all the way down, all the way around. So it, it's still it's still dissected, um, but as I said, they had to they had to put me back together because otherwise I couldn't be that long under anesthesia because I'd run into uh, brain damage issues because I can't be that long under anesthesia. So basically, what it is, they have to monitor the rest of it so it doesn't okay. doesn't rupture. But it doesn't part metal, you know, part human, part Frankenstein, uh, all Richie Faulkner <laughs> here on in the trenches. The, I like long it. Long story short, they just have to they just have to monitor it. Um, but it should where the split is, it should scar over. As long as I keep blood pressure down and stuff like that, it should scar over. And if it doesn't, they can just operate on it. So we'll see. But you're you're feeling good. You're actually feeling uh, well. Thank you very much, Vic Chalfont, for putting it. And we're here with Doctor Richie Faulkner, learning about. <laughs> <laughs> so the, where where it split was where the aorta curves around the top. That's that's where the the, the where it burst, um, yes. and where it go it goes down. So it goes down here, and that's where it's still dissected. So you know, yeah. but it, it's going to be okay. All right, cool. So, so those of you that have just tuned into the podcast and you go back to that thing, um, uh, this is not uh, go back to that graphic, Vic. Uh, this is not uh, Richie Faulkner's newest uh, FX pedal. It's not his newest <laughs> delay or chorus. This is actually his heart, and we are talking about what happened. But we are moving. There you go. There's a nice bus space for you. Um, the thing we do like to talk about, though, is music mostly. But this is important to talk about because your health um, was got better very quickly enough so that you announced that you were going to do this uh, 50 year anniversary tour just recently, but there was a little twist with it. And I want you to sort of walk us through what happened because I know there was a little bit of a controversy, some pushback with the fans, but then everything seems to have been rectified. And what is the plan now going forward? So start at the beginning. And how did this all come about? Because you did make an announcement that you were going to tour as a four piece, correct? Yeah. Rob, Rob called me up and he said, um, he said, Falcon, he said, uh, would you be able to, handle all the guitar parts on your own without a second guitar player and i said well i said yeah i I probably would be able to handle them you know it will probably take a bit of moving around and you know doing things a bit differently you know a couple more pedals and stuff like that because he was thinking i think at one time priest were a four piece and he was thinking about going back to that um you know and glenn coming out when he could 
Um, but I think that was that was the idea in his mind. Um, and I said, dude, whatever you want to do, boss. You know what I mean? Like if that's if that's what you're thinking, you know, if everyone else is on board with it, um, whatever you want to do. Um, so I went and I went and bought. I think I bought three harmonizer pedals to try some stuff out, and then we. You know, long story short, we went back on the decision. So I've got. Do you want to? By the way, do you want to buy a harmonizer? <laughs> you got three of them. You know, I've been in your position before, but only for two shows because we did have a show uh, where our guitar player Eric Dover at the time couldn't do the shows, and it was too uh, late of notice to cancel the shows, and right. too late of notice to get anyone out there to learn uh, the parts of yeah. of for all these songs. So I did do actually two alice cooper shows um as as a one guitar player band did you ever did you rehearse this or was it something that you ever went to the point where you were able to utilize those three harmonizers or did it ever get to that point it never got to that point no um i was just i mean there there was a few there's a few things the set we've got at the moment um apart from the rhythm guitars underneath the solos there's not a lot of harmony stuff going on uh victim of changes are Dude, I've been playing Thin Lizzy in cover bands all my life with one guitar. So, you know, you play, it's, it's all a, like a third. You know, you work out both parts yeah, anyway. The inversions. I, yeah. I know that I, I know that little trick. It, it works, but it's not easy. No, it's not. Yeah. And, um, and I understand what the fans were saying. I think, I think we all understood what the fans were saying in the end. It's not, um, it's not priest that's that's the bottom line you know i think if it was uh if we did a new album that was you know if glenn for whatever reason couldn't play on it or if, if we did it for one guitar uh and then we toured that album that was one guitar it would be a different thing that would be like um, a, a, a sort of a new uh era yeah or a, new, a new type of direction and, yeah and and that would be you could tour that and include a lot of the older material because it's yeah. classic and at this yeah. point you know you, at this point, you can't uh, not play no. certain Judas Priest songs in a set. No. But, you know, it is one of those things where uh, you don't realize how heavily dominant a two guitar player band uh, you're in until you're faced with that position, I can imagine. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we, we, I think everyone saw that we listened and, you know, we saw the reaction. Uh, and we discussed it within ourselves. And I think Rob's um, come out a couple of days ago, and he he, he said that it was his it was his idea, uh, and he sort of it blew but up. But knowing in Rob, face. he's do, he wants to do it for the love of like getting out there for the fans because he wants to get out there and play for people because he wants he wants to rock. We have had, we've had him on the podcast before, oh, yeah. and he just has such a passion for performance that I'm sure it was something that he's like, let's get it out there to the people. But I, I, I think it's, it's really respectful that you were listened to your fans made a different decision. And now as it stands now, when is the 50th tour um, celebration going to begin? And what do you have in the works for that? Well, we, I think the first rescheduled date uh, is in Peoria, Illinois on the 4th of March. So I think it's, what's the date today? Is it the 4th or the 5th? Of February? It's, so, it's somewhere, somewhere around wherever we are right now in the world, and wherever you're watching this, it's somewhere in the January, late, oh no, early February type of date. So we've got right. about a month. We've we got, got a about month, four yeah. weeks to go. Yeah, okay. So we're going to, you know, we're going to start rehearsing at the end of the month, do about four or five rehearsals and then uh, get back on it. So um and it'll be good because like mentally you know what it's like when you've got a string of dates yeah and then it's like mentally we did we didn't do them so it's like there's a hole mentally oh well I, you could say that with all of 2020 it just had the the whole rug put from yeah. so many of our bands yeah. uh feet that we yeah. were you know hey i we were expecting to do this 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 and this yeah. and then all of a sudden we weren't doing it so now i understand yeah. the um the urgency, not the urgency, but the, 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 the need to get out there and play because oh, yeah. now that I'm out, as you can see, I'm in a hotel room. Usually I'm in, in my little studio in up in Sweden, but you seem, you know, I'm in some hotel room now, but yeah. I'm loving it because guess what? Tomorrow's a show. We get to see well, people. We get to play know, for people. That's what was such a bummer. You know, we, we've gone through 2020, all of 2021 and we got closer and closer. We've done rehearsals. 
we done production rehearsals. Everything's still going ahead. We got on the plane. We're out on tour. We're doing it. We're out. We made it. We're on tour. And then it was me. <laughs> all down. So, yeah, um, but I mean, that's understandable, dude. You were like, you know, well, what can, what else can you do? I mean, you have much. you can't you had to improve. You had to get better. Now you're fit. You're ready to go. Um, what and another huge thing that's just been released is that now Priest looks like they are on the ballot for the next Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And again, us being the new guys in these legacy bands, um, how do we feel about, you know, because I, I, I know that uh, they've picked, you know, Halford, Ian, Glenn, Scott, um, KK, Les Banks, and, uh, and Dave Holland as the inductees. But we are part of that legacy, yeah. but we're not. We're so, not. so I mean, is it nothing but support and love and cheerleading? Or is there a little bit of you or I maybe that says, well, I wouldn't mind being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Or do we feel like, or, 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 or are we? Do you know what? I've said this before. I've got my own opinion about it. And I don't necessarily agree with the rest of the guys. Um like but then I, I wouldn't have the same opinion. I haven't been doing it for 50 years. So yeah. I, you know, I, the, the credibility, you know, I've said this before, so I'm going <laughs> to say it again. I, I can't say something different now, but right. the credibility to me of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, if you don't have bands like Priest, Thin Lizzy, Iron Maiden, if, if they're not in there from the first place, what is it? It doesn't mean much to be in it anyway. Right. And I, right. I think to, to tour the world, release records to millions of fans around the world for 50 years in countries and cities and, you know, still do it. They're, they're still putting out new music. We're right. still touring. Right. That to me is more of an accolade than an award ceremony or a, a trophy on a shelf and well, you know that will probably bite me on the ass one day when i get inducted but like i'll have to say no like, <laughs> no no <laughs> you'll say i've taken some time to reflect well, and uh... <laughs> they need to i think they if it's called the rock and roll hall of fame they need to make it more rock and roll because otherwise it's almost more credible not to be in it right you know right, right that's right, right. that's my opinion and uh, you know well, I mean, here's the thing. I'm very proud of what I've been able to, in this band, this whole band that we have, this current lineup, that we've been able to contribute the to the longevity of Alice's legacy. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, though, the tunes that people come for, the tunes that people wait and get jump up on the top of their chairs for, are those tunes, just like me and you, we heard as as kids, and they've lasted the test of time, and guess what? Though that original band wrote those amazing songs that I still have a job. Thousand percent. Yeah. Thousand percent. I just think that when that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was founded, should have had they should have all been in there from the as beginning. by default. Yeah. They should yeah, have yeah. all been in there. You know. Well, I mean, speaking of these songs, what was did you start out a priest fan or uh did did you discover them a little bit later in your guitar playing life and if so what was the album that was sort of like the huh look at that band maybe i can play guitar for them someday <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a little bit later um i knew songs like living after midnight breaking the law another thing coming i didn't know it was the band judas priest um it was only after painkiller i think so you know early early to you know early 90s I was maybe 12 uh, and I was getting into, you know, heavier stuff like, you know, Metallica and stuff. Painkiller mm -hmm. came out. Yeah, exactly. The, the, I must have been about 13, maybe 12, 13 there. Um, and you weren't into Kurt Cobain at all because you could have been in a really good Kurt Cobain tribute band of that picture. <laughs> Go back, Vic. Let me see that. Oh, <laughs> there it is. Richie Faulkner on Halloween being Kurt Cobain. Come on. You're a good looking 
That's UK really funny. Brit. That's really funny. No, I was against all that. I was like, it didn't speak to me. I, I've got the the grunge thing later with the songwriting thing. Right. But at the time, you know, because my dad brought me up on Hendrix and Lizzie and Sabbath, um, and from there it went. You know, Iron Maiden sounded like Lizzie, so I was like, oh, I get that. You know, and you know what I mean. Like, and there was um, parts of Metallica was like, oh, that sounds like Sabbath on on steroids. You know, so I could relate to the next thing. Right. Um, and, and, and so much of that Birmingham, Birmingham oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, sound was a, a, a different type of Seattle sound, if you will. Oh, and, yeah. And it, and, and it definitely, you know, bounced off each other and put it this way. And I, and I remember KK on the, on the podcast talking about them as a four piece to begin with and how, you know, uh, Sabbath was one of those bands that they would see around, you know, town. Yeah. And, take this from take that from and everybody sort of like you know hey we got our own thing going now now we're we have our own identity um what contributions uh do you make to judas priest that you are most proud of because you have actually made a very important record and hopefully more records to come that's a great question man i i don't i don't know uh i've never i don't know it's a great question um <laughs> I just try and do what I think is right, you know. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't try and reinvent the, you know, when we're doing like a new record or something like that. I don't, I don't try and reinvent the wheel or anything, you know. I just try and do what I think's right stylistically. And well, put it this way: if you can't answer that question, I will, tr I will give you my opinion of what I think your your biggest contribution is, is that you. You breathed new life into a band and rejuvenated some classic, amazing, talented rock and rollers and just completely gave them, that band, a new life. So That's very go. nice. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I couldn't Your energy, myself, man, but, it, you know. it does. Because now you're the, you know, people root for you and you, and, and, and hopefully you know this, that, uh, you know, across the guitar playing community, across the metal community, people are rooting for you. And, and obviously the, you know, you getting your complete aorta <laughs> blown up is, is going to like, you know, almost strengthen that Marvel comics superhero type of guy. But, you know, you must know that, uh, yeah, you are a fan favorite, you know, and it's, it's cool. It's, it's not, it's not arrogance. It's definite confidence, and it's all around uh, genuine type of guy. And I've, that's and really I've, nice of you to say, man. I really appreciate that. Well, I mean, thanks. I mean, hey, it's it's not. I'm not saying it disingenuously. I'm saying it because I've seen you interact with your fans. I've seen you, you know, backstage at these festivals where a lot of fans don't get access to, and you are always um, a, a very even keel, you know, genuine positive person and i think well, they, attitude goes a long way well they've, they've always been you know not only have the band been accepting and welcoming and you know the fans have as well and you know from day one you know and we still you know what it's like you, you sometimes go up to territories you haven't been or the band hasn't been before and definitely haven't been with me before but I, I remember we went to new zealand a couple of years ago and the band had never been to new zealand before you know, which was shocking to me, but like, so you're always going to a place where the, there's a fan somewhere that not only hasn't seen you with the band, but hasn't seen the band ever, yeah. you know, uh, and you can never kind of take that for granted, really. And they're seeing the band for the first time or seeing you with them for the first time. And you're, it's your duty, you know, and you're kind of, I've only been there, I've been there 10 years now, but, you know, Ken was there for 40. He put 40 years in. They've put 50 years in and you're kind of, they're trusting you to kind of do the job with them. Uh, and you can't really forget that. And and also, as you said, when this happened last September, the kind of the outreach of, of, of the fans kind of reaching out and expressing their, their feelings of, you know, get well soon. And it, it's just been incredible, really. Um, so I can't thank them enough, can't thank them enough really from the beginning the support they've given me you know i mean because everyone's going to be skeptical you know you you're replacing uh someone who's been there for 40 yeah. years they're going to be and, skeptical and, and you're like 
I, I, I hate to keep on bringing the machine thing back, the Terminator. You are T two compared to T one. You know what I'm saying? You're the new. You know, and 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 you. There's going to be no doubt about it. Some people that are you know team KK forever or whatever. And and of course, how how has that or has it? ever affected any interactions that you've had with KK and have, and has it, have you had interactions? Have they been positive, negative or indifferent? Um, well, the ones with him, I say directly, like, you know, through Twitter or whatever, uh, have been positive. I mean, there was one, he said something about my payment structure, which was, <laughs> which okay. was weird for someone to say, and it wasn't true, which, which was a bit mind blowing, but that, that that whole situation with him and the band over the last ten years, it, to me, has been totally unnecessary. You know, it, it's been a it's been a bit of a shit show. But and I don't know why that is. Um, to me, music aside, they should you know maybe pick up the phone and just talk to each other as buddies, communication, you know, yeah. and go and have a beer and just be pals. You know, fuck the music for a minute. Just let's just be pals. You know, and then whatever happens happens. But um, I- I think your attitude is 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 probably the the most you know the smartest way, and I think the the attitude that that, that like hey, hey let's let's let the music aside, let's just be guys for a second because at the end of the day they're guys. They were they were pals yeah. for forty years, yeah. you know they lived pretty much together for forty years, four decades. Yeah, you know. Well, it's not lost on the fact that that you know you're not stirring the pot. You're just saying what you feel, oh, and, right. and, and and I don't I don't want to get I don't want to start. That's the thing. We live in a world where everybody wants. Oh, what's the sound bite? Oh, do I want to hear this hate? I want to hear this. You know, what's the contract? No, I I think in when you're in this position, you want to. And and this is not similar because Alice does actually have a really cool relationship with all the the original band members, and now I have a cool relationship with them. I've hung around long enough. I've been around long enough. I have close relationships with all of them. I was able to play right. with the original band right. um, on some shows, but I, I feel that, you know, it's always going to have to be a respect, and we do a good job of giving respect to those original songwriters, that original band. Yeah, and you do absolutely. a great job. Every night you do. You you yeah. pay in a way you pay tribute to all of that original band's work. Of course, you and know? I just you know I, I wish it was different. I wish you know that all that weirdness of the last ten years didn't need to happen. If 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 they like parted on good terms, maybe things would be different now. But um, unfortunately, that didn't that didn't happen. But um, no. you know, I just wish there'd be. Hey, I'm gonna wait for the. Maybe by the hundredth year anniversary, because I don't see Judas Priest talking anytime soon. So you got fifty. We can do it another fifty years, right? Well, well if they if they uh, if they get in the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, maybe that's uh, you know, uh, mm. uh, you know. Gotcha. All right. Well, who knows? Yeah. Who well, knows? We, we we won't speculate too much, but what we will do is we'll get as many people um, checking out Richie Faulkner and how to get in touch with you, so that um, basically, you know. Anytime that you uh, need some extra rock and roll support, they will be there for you. Um, for those of that are listening on the um, podcast, on the platforms, can you please tell the best way to get in touch with Richie Faulkner, Richie? Well, you want me to tell him? Yeah, if you want. You're, you're sitting right there. You got, and you got all the links right there beside you. So well, here go. they are. On this side, <laughs> here they are over here. You can check, you check me out. It's... Um... I haven't been that uh, busy actually. I've been off off the socials because of obvious reasons. But um, you can check me out on obviously the the Instagrams and the Facebooks, and obviously the priests uh, versions of the same. I think it's Judas Priest on uh, Instagram and Facebook, and obviously the Judas Priest Vivo on YouTube, um, and the dot coms as well. Obviously, uh, I'm going to get back on it because obviously we're going out on tour soon, so there'll be lots of fun stuff to be posting obviously up until now i've been uh, taking it easy you don't want to see my cardiac rehab photos it's like, <laughs> like if not you can just Jesus, you know? yeah you can just actually dm our producer vic chalfant and he'll send you a pdf of that heart aorta uh, schematic that he put up but i love the fact what if, 
if they go on to your um, socials, are there any updates for the fans on what type of music we can look forward to? Um, perhaps something new that might be similar sound to Firepower, or would it be a change in direction? On what? Sorry. Uh, if you were to put out some new music with Priest, would you think it would be a similar sound to the uh, great album Firepower that you released with the band, or would it be uh, a bit of a change in direction? In, That's a in, great in a question. World? That's a great question. That's all I do is ask great questions because I have a great team that writes those great questions. Thank That's you. That's a great question. <laughs> well, you know, you I, and I could tell you like what I think it would be now, and then you'd go in and record it, and it could it would it would be something totally different by the end of it. You know. Um, <laughs> I think what do I think I think it would be I think it would be different I think it would it would share the same DNA obviously it would share the same sort of lineage it would be the next evolution of it wouldn't be it, it wouldn't be firepower too it would stand on its own legs but it would right. you know what I mean it would be the next evolution of Firepower still, but, without being firepower, and, and still signature priest because yeah, you know, thousand percent, thousand percent. And when and when you have your own solo stuff that eventually, when it comes out, like I said, I know you said if and when. <laughs> I'm saying when it comes out, um, I will be looking forward to what style that will be in because that will be you know a whole different type of thing for Richie Faulkner solo. But yeah. uh, again, maybe that's for another podcast and maybe that's yeah. for another thing. What we do have going and another uh, last thing I want to broach on, if anyone's interested in playing the guitar and learning how to play guitar, uh, Richie and I are both pretty heavily uh, into Gibson guitars. We all have been. The Flying V is obviously a Gibson classic. I'm a, a Les Paul guy, but I do play six different styles. I do have a V on stage. I do have a, a Explorer. I have a Firebird. I have a SG. Um, are you strictly only Flying Vs for Gibson? No, uh, I've got a, an Explorer out with me. I've got an, like an Explorer custom thing. Um, right. And I, I've always got a Les Paul out with me. I see it right behind your head right there. Oh, nice double neck. Uh, that too. one. Yeah, that, that one's a, yeah, it's a beautiful one, that one. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I wait have a, a, the Les Paul is kind of like um, almost like a benchmark that we have to have a, Le, a Les Paul out with us because, you know, if anything goes out, we can set it. To... Always get the Les I mean, the Les Paul I have, I mean, I mean you can see... Uh... There it is. It's back to the hotel room, right? Guitar. Right oh, there. yeah. The it's trusty really nice Les Paul. Fantastic. <laughs> so, and we, and we both are actually uh, teaching some lessons on the Gibson app. So if anyone wants to check that out, they just go to your local app. I think it's Android and uh, your iTunes app. It's called the Gibson app. And you can see uh, Richie Faulkner and myself. We're teaching different songs. I did a bunch of classic Alice Cooper songs. Um, I know that you're working with uh, clearing the songs, but are they going to be priest songs? And once, once everything, all the legal stuff gets taken care of? Yeah, they're going to be priest songs. Um, if I can, if I can remember how to play them, right. You know, Not, and you didn't decide to do a Nirvana song just to make sure with that picture of you looking. No, so that, much like... well, you never know. Though. You never know. <laughs> but it's funny. Like sometimes we do, um, you know, I've, I've done a couple of those instructional videos before and I play them out, we play them live. So I've got uh, emails of people, are you, you're not playing it right. Well, that, yeah, I'm probably not. I play it different every night. You know what I mean? I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's the way, it, 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 to quote Gilby Clark, that's the way the guys do it. All right. Yeah. I, we've, been, we've been doing it the way the guys do it for years and years and years. And and usually, to be honest with you, if it's a if it's a classic Alice Cooper song and I really need to know the way it needs to be played. It's usually some 15 year old kid on YouTube that uh, <laughs> has already put it on his uh, iPhone and, and posted it up. So thank you. 15 year old kids out there, carry the torch, but check out the Gibson app with uh, Richie and I as well. Um, in closing, Richie, again, thanks for spending the time with us in the trenches. I really appreciate it. Look forward to the 50th anniversary tour. Um, our, hopefully we'll cross paths again somewhere, some backstage, some festival stage. Um, what are you most excited for in 2022, either professionally or personally? Do you know what? I'm looking forward to getting out and staying out. You know what I mean? Getting out right. on the road and staying out on the road and uh, getting some miles under our belts without, you know, this, this it's been going on for too long. You know, um, I'm looking forward to getting over to Europe. We haven't been over to Europe for a while. So I'm just looking forward to getting out playing live because that's what i don't know about you but that's you know that's what we do it for 
um, getting out, playing live, and I haven't been doing that enough. So looking forward to doing that. That's that's what yes. I'm most excited for. Cool. I th- I didn't even uh, broach the fact that yeah, you're kind of a Nashville guy. And what was that decision that that uh, brought you through? Did you live in LA for a long time, or did you live East Coast, or what made you decide Nashville was the place to be? I, I like the seasons. I, I do quite a bit of stuff out in the States anyway. So um, I, was, I was out in Florida and I just got bored bored with the one season. It's just sunny all the time. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from the UK. So when, you know, when it's Christmas, it's hot in Florida. Yeah. You know, it's like 90, you know, 95 degrees. In the summer, <laughs> it's 105. And it doesn't, yeah. doesn't really change. And I'm used to the seasons changing. Oh, so uh, we came down to Nashville. We know a few people over here as well. Um, you know, the, the industry is, is still a, a music industry down here, which is great as well. Um, and we get the seasons. It's beautiful down here. We just had some beautiful snow. Um, yeah. We have beautiful summers. Uh, so it's the seasons, really. I love the seasons. Uh-huh. Well, if you ever want to come visit a place that has winter for eight months out of the year, come up and visit me in Stockholm, Sweden, which I'm sure we'll see you. I used to live in Stockholm. I, I lived in Stockholm for about four years. Okay, so you didn't mind that sort of grayish, uh, you know, sort of darkish, cold, you know, dark Not by for that o'clock. long. Not for yeah. that long. It was pretty, right. and then everything turns gray and, and, and slushy. But uh, If you would have said yes, I would have definitely said you, you were – you were lying to me about the Kurt Cobain influence because then it was <laughs> very much like Seattle, like that grayish area there. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, Richie, it's been a pleasure having you on. Next time we come on, hopefully we'll be uh, in some sort of backstage. We'll have you on. We'll talk a little bit more equipment, but yeah, I'm glad we were able to talk about your health, your, uh, your, on the mend, you're ready to rock the 50th anniversary, Judas Priest, uh, rock and roll hall of fame. And, um, perhaps some sort of solo Richie Faulkner happening in the future. So, Hey, anything else to say to the fans? Like, uh, like, cause you've gone through so much. I always usually leave with people saying, is there a piece of advice that you give, you would give to an upcoming musician or to anyone in general that's helped you cope and get through this thing called life? Check your blood pressure. First of all, <laughs> Doesn't you know if you're my age? I've got to say, I've got to tell, I've got to tell everyone, get your blood pressure checked because you never know. You know what I mean? Um, that's that's the main thing. I mean, it'll probably change in the next six months. I'll give you some different advice, but that's the main piece of advice I can give you. And you as well, Roxy, check your blood pressure as well. I'm checking it right now. Um, right. I, I I actually I'm I, I gotta now. go. I gotta go check it out now. Go I, check well, it we, out. We're, we're giving. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll do it right after my COVID test because we get we, we, we get COVID tested every single day on the tour. We're still in the tour bubble, but and, and you'll figure that out. I mean, you guys will have your own protocols and stuff like that. But of yeah, course. you know what, people? Stay healthy, uh, stay strong, stay metal. We've been here with Richie Faulkner in the trenches. Thank you, team. Thank you, everybody. We will be back next week, but until that next time, tell a friend, promote this episode, and above all, Enjoy the ride. See you guys. Cheers. In the trenches with Ryan Roxy.